cool. Uh, look, let's get started. Uh, as we say, I'm, I'm sure it will take us off script after about two questions, mm -hmm. but a nice, easy one to start with, Todd. It's always good just to kind of get the ball rolling with a, a bit of an intro. So um, <clears throat> I'm sure you've done it many times before, but just, just a sort of brief introduction to yourself. Um, I guess particularly with, with regards to, to your experience within the sector, obviously, but, but also how that's kind of influenced your approach to your current work at Rapid7 and, and if there's any kind of key messages you've taken through through your career to influence your current work. Uh, sure, yeah. So I'm Todd Beardsley. Um, I've been at Rapid7 for 10 years and change, um, mm -hmm. which is stupendously long tech. Uh, <laughs> that's like four jobs worth of job. Um, and I, I started at Rapid7 um, 10 years ago uh, as part of the Metasploit crew. So mm -hmm. when Rapid7 acquired Metasploit, um, it was and is an open source project. Uh, that was pretty much the de facto standard, as far as I could tell, for like penetration testers. Um, okay. It was the Swiss Army knife of uh, exploits and proof of concept code and payloads and evasion techniques and like basically all the things that a penetration tester would need. Mm -hmm. um, and I helped work on that. Um, I was already a, an open source contributor to that. Um, I worked with H.G. Moore, who was like, he's the marquee name on, on Metasploit. I worked with mm. him for real at a real job. Um, at the time, we were both at, we were both at Breaking Point, um, which was a network testing company. Um, okay. And then he negotiated this thing with Rapid7. They somehow acquired an open source project. I don't even know how that even works uh, <laughs> because it's still open source. It's two clause BSD, um, which basically which means yeah. You know, I don't know how nerdy you get about open source licensing, but two clause BSD is the best open source license. <laughs> um, it's it's the one that says like you can literally do whatever you want. You can sell it. You can do what it, like we are oh. arming up competitors, right? Mm -hmm. um, and people do like other uh, legit competitors of Rapid Seven use Metasploit like okay. routinely, um, and so anyway, um, I was working on that project. I came over when um, it became clear that Rapid Seven wasn't going to destroy Metasploit. Um, this was a big question mark at the time, <laughs> and they continue to not destroy uh, Metasploit, <laughs> so I continue to work here, cool. um, and it's and it's super fun. And so like I had before that, like I did have this background of. You know, I was I did red teaming and penetration testing. Um, mm -hmm. I did auditing. I did some bug hunting. Mm -hmm. um, I did a bunch in patch management. Um, I used to work at uh, Dell and Westinghouse, so like big okay. Windows shop footprint yeah. things. Um, and patch <clears throat> management was nightmarish then. Mm -hmm. um, it's kids these days, you know, like they have it easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, like I had change control review boards to deal with and all that. Um, so uh, I feel like that background in IT like in IT ops um, yeah. really did inform like a lot of you know kind of like security common sense for me sure um, you know it's it's a sense that uh, I sometimes don't get from folks that are like go to school for cybersecurity and get the degree and get the CSSP and then go work in cybersecurity like they've never actually <laughs> you know run a mail server <laughs> and yeah. like, dealt with that um, so there is a little bit of like kids these days about that and, you know, kind of school of hard knocks in there. And there are other <laughs> avenues to this career, right? Like you can absolutely be like a data scientist and like mm. have great things to say about security. Like I work with one here at Rapid7. Uh, sure. Uh, Quan Lin is, is amazing. He's, uh, at Quantitative on, on, uh, on Twitter, uh, KW Quantitative. Okay. That's pretty funny. Um, but he's really great. Um, but as far as I know, he's never had an IT job. Um, okay. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, so like uh, first order business, get an IT job, work help desk, uh, work your way up, and then say this is fixing things sucks. I want to break things um, <laughs> and get into security. It's far now. more fun. So that is that is my first question. I hope this kind of answer is the kind of answer you're looking for. Because yeah, yeah, it, it, those it are the does. ones I give. <laughs> yeah, no, it's All cool. Right. Um, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you referenced the the, the ten years at Rapid Seven mm -hmm. thing, and and. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's a, a, a decent time to be at the company. I mean, it, firstly, you know, I'd like to come onto the, the market kind of context and how that's shifted. But I mean, how has the business changed in that time? And, and I guess has that followed how the market has evolved in terms in terms of cybersecurity and threat landscape and things like that? Or uh huh. Um, so yeah, during the time I've been Rapid Seven, I've had three or four jobs, I'd say total, yeah. like yeah. distinct jobs with distinct different bosses and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but over that time, like Rapid7 has grown from, 
you know, about a 200 person company that had essentially two products, mm -hmm. uh, which at the time was Nexpos, which is now Insight VMs, the vulnerability mm -hmm. management product. Mm -hmm. um, and Metasploit, uh, Metasploit mm -hmm. Pro, like the commercial version of Metasploit. And incidentally, like managing the open source project too. Sure. Um, they had some like real light assessment work at the time 10 years ago, mm -hmm. but now we have like a full blown pen testing um, out organization. That's really good. Like we do, and we do a bunch, we do hundreds and hundreds of pen tests in a year. Okay. Um, and, you know, we employ, I don't know, 20 ish or so penetration testers that are at like max capacity all the time. Yeah. Um, and we and we uh, run a, another giant offering we have now is um, uh, incident detection and response, which we hadn't had before. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, that's a big deal. Like, it is it is uh, the value proposition there is it's not if but when you get compromised. So how are you going to deal yep. with that? And so yep. it's all detection. And there's like an endpoint solution, which was like unheard of 10 years ago. It's like, mm -hmm. no, we all hate endpoint. That's AV. <laughs> AV is garbage. Um, it's like, turns out when you make an, <laughs> when you make an EDR, uh, AV gets less garbagey, um, especially when you're smart about it. And like, we don't do like the AV, you know, the classic AV traps, right? It's sure. like, we'll just, we'll just throw hashes at it and see what, see what happens. Mm. Um, you know, so, so yeah, we have a pretty, pretty large, um, both automated incident detection and response, and then we also have managed detection and response. So mm -hmm. it's like IDR versus MDR. These are mm -hmm. acronyms we use a lot, and sometimes mm -hmm. interchangeably. Um, MDR is like you call the bat phone, basically. You're like, oh okay. no, I just got to. <laughs> what do I do now? Um, we offer like crisis comms for for companies. Right. Like if you've gotten known, like how do you deal with the press? Um, you know, we do. I me in particular, I do a lot of uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure work. So okay. that means like. If we discover a vulnerability somewhere in Rapid7 um, against some other software, like I'll yeah. you know run that ball down the field. Okay. Um, if people out in the world discover vulnerabilities, they don't know what to do. Like, you know, maybe they're not comfortable with a bug bounty, or mm -hmm. they discovered it on the job, but they don't want to like they want to be anonymous or something like that. Um, like I will help them, you know, get that bug fixed and okay. and published and all that. So, and that's like a free thing. Like I don't charge anybody for this. I'm oh, not cool. charging, like, okay. because I have this background in open source. Like my first instinct is just, oh, just publish it all. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> I, I get paid the same either way. It doesn't matter to me. Um, <laughs> oh, that doesn't apply to everything, <laughs> everything that you own and do. <laughs> uh, actually, pretty much. So like we produce, uh, you know, unique research. Um, mm -hmm. We, we produce things. Uh, coming from a couple projects, Project Sonar and Project Heisenberg. Sonar in particular is a project where we scan the whole internet and we tell you what we find. Um, yeah. And that tell you what we find is the hard part because like counting things is hard, turns out. Like if you take any kind of number theory class, you will learn this immediately. It's like, oh wow, it turns out <laughs> counting things is really hard. Um, <laughs> And, but we published all of that for free at opendata.rapidseven.com. If you go to that website, you can yep. sign up and like get <laughs> like pretty raw sonar feeds there if you want. So like this is an example of Rapid 7's like commitment to open source and open science and open data, right? Like we we feel like the world is a better place if, which is so, such a trite thing to say, but we do really believe it. It's in our DNA where um, if we give this stuff out for free, even if it's like to competitors. Um, yeah. or who met or just strangers, whatever. Um, we, we make sure you're not a criminal by like basically asking. And, <laughs> yeah. um, Give me everything. But, <laughs> right. Um, and we'll, we'll bet like who you are, you know, it's like, we'll do like a very light touch kind of like, are you sure that you're mm -hmm. not a criminal? Mm -hmm. Um, but like we will give it out and we know like good things happen at that point. Like it's a very yeah, kind yeah. of, you know, it's it's like a Wikimedia sort of notion of just opening everything up. So but but is 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 that is that unique or is that relatively unique in the market? Do other companies do other obviously you met you mentioned it obviously as a mm -hmm. bit of a kind of ethos. I mean, is is that mm -hmm. something that's pretty unique to Rapid Seven, would you say? Or I I think it's I think that there Every security company that's worth talking about has yeah. some kind of like research and lab sure. function. Mm. Um, how much they share can be super varied. Like some companies will do like vulnerability research and they'll present at Black Hat, but they won't like release code. Um, yeah. They'll put videos and they'll talk around it, but they're not going to give you the code. Mm -hmm. um, because that either that secret sauce or it's too dangerous for the people to handle, you know, like you can't, yeah. handle, the, you can't handle the pot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and if, but we give out proof of concept in the form of Metasploit, right? So okay. I think yeah. that is 
specifically unusual. And I don't, you know, I don't know of any, I won't say that. I know I have a couple, but I, very few companies have an open source footprint like Rapid7 does. Uh, okay. Through Metasploit, through Meterpreter, which is a, it's kind of a component of Metasploit, but it, mm -hmm. Meterpreter is basically the kind of rootkit payload that Metasploit defaults to, but it's kind mm -hmm. of like a ton of features. And um, it was really cool, actually. I can talk about Meterpreter for, just by itself for an hour, but um, <laughs> uh, but that was developed by hackers and also like game programmers, game designers, people who do oh, ports cool. for Windows games. Yeah, yeah, you've yeah. Got, you have to be like uh, elbows deep in the kernel for that right. stuff to even work. And so like so many good kernel tricks are in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that like for like video game optimization turns out is uh, a straight shot to rootkits. Um, <laughs> so uh, that was really fun. Um, but we do that. We, we work on a project now. My, my favorite Rapid7 you know, forgotten middle child of open source is a project we have called Recog, um, mm -hmm. which is a, a library of fingerprints, basically, and, and some mm -hmm. you know struts around it to make it work. But um, but the the main thing about it is this giant library of fingerprints of of, of devices. Um, yep. And so like you're familiar with Nmap, I'm sure. Um, it's Nmap is pretty good at like discovering like what a service is, like a given service, and then it makes some mm -hmm. guesses about like oh what version is it, and it does some other things. Recog is a, a crowdsourced implementation of like, oh, you have like a smart TV, what's that look like? You know, and okay. like you can describe it in this this XML mm -hmm. format. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bummer that it's XML, but it is what it is. Um, and it's mainly, it's XML so other things can consume it. But again, it's like, it's another one of these things where it's like two clause BSD, anyone can use it for literally anything other than crime okay. um, and, and people can run around with it, so. Cool. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the 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 threat reports is is the big piece mm -hmm. of work we've we've been looking at, and and I've sure. just produced something on it. Um, I mean, I guess before we kind of delve into some of the findings in that report and and the research that that you've been working on for that, um, I was interested in, <clears throat> and again, this is probably a subject that you could talk on for some while, but <laughs> against the kind of context of 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 your your career at Rapid Seven, those ten years, and you talked about the evolving mm -hmm. proposition of the company. I mean, how has the threat landscape yeah. changed? Perhaps. You want to look more recently. Um, I guess this is kind of a context question, but but what what do you see as main kind of trends as driving threat and risk for organizations, and 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 how has that changed or evolved as I guess you know greater adoption of technology and different technologies by organizations and so on. So I'd say like the biggest change, like the most significant change of the last. I'd say the window of like five to 10 years sure. is um, just shoveling everything into the cloud, right? Like, and mm -hmm. having like really good, um, really excellent um, infrastructure provided by Microsoft, by Amazon, by Google, um, yep. you know, and these are outfits that know how security works and like they yep. do security by default um, most of the time. Well, <laughs> we can talk about that, um, but uh, it, it's it's just so much better than just like running your own racks of, of servers, right? Like mm -hmm. you suck at this, like you, everyone yeah. is awful at this. Um, and so like, and if it's not your business, then you you are doubly bad at it. Mm. Um, you know, if your job, like my job used to be like selling computers on the internet, security is, you know, important, but security is job four. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and so like that change um, changes things about the, but, you know, your kinds of threats, like, you know, mm. people need to worry about like their Docker containers and their Kubernetes and like all these other like technologies that they existed 10 years ago, nobody knew them. Like, right. um, yeah. you know, so it was like, it, it's that kind of notion of, um, you know, open S3 buckets is a big, big deal on AWS where like people still configure their S3 buckets in a, in a, in a naive way um, okay. with like global read, sometimes global write, uh, you know, because it just works, right? Because it's not yeah. their business. Their business is not secure. And like, oh, it's Amazon, everything's fine. And then not mm -hmm. realizing that they're shooting themselves in the foot in the development process. Mm -hmm. um, and so like that, that I'd say is the biggest change. But like, other than that, honestly, like the, the, the old threats of like phishing email is yeah. 
here, right? Like it is, that is the number one threat. If you can like solve phishing, you solve 90% of your problems for sure. Um, okay. uh, the, <laughs> the secret is no one solve phishing. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, network segmentation is a big, big deal. Like you get network, you get some notion of network segmentation for free with all this cloud stuff. Cause like, yeah. oh, it's not, it's literally not on premises. It's Google's problem. It's a different IP space. You can't, even if you owned everything in my like cloud environment, you don't get a shot at my desktops, you know, sure. like, okay. and, and yeah. I don't get a shot at my, I, and you don't get a shot at that from my desktops most yeah. of the time. Um, like, unless you get lucky and you like, you hit a developer or something like mm. that, but who has stored keys and they're doing it wrong. But anyway, um, you, you have to get really lucky in order to like bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. Other than that though, network segmentation is, is not great um, in the okay. enterprise. Like okay. everything is a big flat network. Um, and and it is really hard to get people to change that. Um, I'm I'm worried today uh, due to the unpleasantness um, about what that looks like for work at home because like if work at home is suddenly you have to work at home, suddenly you have a whole bunch of new VPN traffic you've never had before. Your number one goal is to get it to work to keep the lights on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a recipe for security failure, and Absolutely. we're. I'm I'm curious to see how this works, how this all plays out um, in a very, I don't know, dejected sort of pessimism version of curiosity. <laughs> um, but, but like, I mean, because people like company enterprises were were um, you know they're sizing their their work from home workforce as yeah five yeah. percent or ten percent yeah, of the time, yeah. and like and sizing appropriately for that. Um, and, and and the occasional, you know, working at home because like the kids are off school for like a bank mm. holiday, but not like a mm. company holiday, right? Um, that changed, right? Now it's 100%. Sure. <laughs> you, yeah, you yeah. have 100% utilization now, um, instantaneously. And so, and I do think that I, I am very much looking at, we're working on a report now that we'll publish in June-ish, come oh, June, awesome. um, okay. that looks at kind of like, it's a report we do now every other year it's basically yeah. like an atlas view of the internet um like mm -hmm. and we break it out by country and all this other stuff but anyway it it we're in a position to be able to like kind of track like before and after covid 19 um because we have data on it and yeah. we can say like oh did the world like how much how did the internet change between you know february and may um like what does that look like Wow. And that and that's the kind of question that like really excites me, right? Like that yeah, is yeah, a great course. question and it's a great question to answer in public. Uh, we don't gate <laughs> this report at all. We don't even I don't think we even take sales leads off it. We we use it in like marketing materials, but we don't have like a give us your email and we'll spam you forever <laughs> with our our learnings before you can read this report. So. so so how do you think it will change? I mean, I don't have data, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> but that said, um, I do expect I, I think the confluence of phishing being the number one threat, the lack of um, network segmentation, and suddenly everyone has a straight shot to their internal network over VPN is, mm. uh, that's worrisome. <laughs> like, sure. I, that's worrisome. I am, I know that there's a ton of scam um, activity out there that is around COVID-19 of like, you know, Click here to collect your welfare check, or click here to yeah, right. Yeah. You like, there's there's a contact tracing, there's a fake contract tra contact tracing scam going around right now, where it like texts you and emails you of, oh, click here to see who in your area has already been infected. Like this is super compelling. Mm -hmm. um, the the payload is a matter of imagination at that point. Like you can sure. run whatever you want, um, and the fact that everyone is VPNing and they're probably not. Let me back up a little bit. So in VPN, um, you have this notion of uh, split tunneling that I don't know if you're familiar with at all. No, 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 no. So it's like split tunneling is basically like some traffic goes to work and some traffic goes to the internet, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So like, so it's really handy for things like I have two Gmail profiles, say, right, or two yeah, Google I profiles. Yeah. I have my personal Gmail and then I have my work <laughs> Gmail, and like mm -hmm. they go different places. So that's like one kind of application notion of it. But in mm -hmm. networking, like there may be resources that are accessible to me that are internal to the network, but I can also hit the whole internet just like from my house. And that's what yeah, yeah, sure. 
this is a disaster for things like instant detection response <laughs> because I don't get to see like all your outbound traffic basically. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used yeah. to I used to control that, right? As a network mm -hmm. operator, I mm -hmm. used to be able to control it. I would have my proxies, I would have all my detection gear on the network, and now I don't see that anymore because all yeah. because I have implemented split tunneling by accident. Um and so like one thing that companies should be doing right now, honestly, like now that we've gotten through like the initial panic, um, companies really need to like measure how their VPN traffic looks. Are okay. are they split tunneling by accident? Because it's almost always the default. Um, yeah. or are they or are they collecting all their traffic and actually shunt it like when I'm when I have my VPN client running, everything that comes from out of my computer should be going through my data center out my out my routers, right? Mm -hmm. Um at, at work. And it shouldn't be like just popping out over my residential ISP. Um, so that'll be that'll be interesting to to measure to see like what that traffic really looks like um, because right, we right. can see some of those changes now because we also run a bunch of honeypots on the internet yeah okay. um, and so we see a bunch of like attack traffic and t very tentatively we're it's looking like we're seeing more unique sources and I think this is because of this is that people are okay. getting owned through some mechanism and then turning around and scanning everything like their computers yep. are um, but they're scanning it from like residential I ISPs where we used to see them like concentrated in like corporate. Mm -hmm. ISP land. But I mean, this is going to be a permanent thing for companies and you know enterprises to fix, right? Because most people, I know it's kind of speculative, but they're saying this is going mm -hmm. to be a, a, a real shift, you know, to remote working, a more digital kind of workspace. So I, I, I do think that like March 2020 will be the, the new eternal September. Um, <laughs> so it is like a <laughs> fundamental change of how the internet functions and how people mm how people interact with the internet mm. because like if you can if it turns out this whole time that like 20 percent of all of your knowledge workers in the world could actually do their job from home why are yeah. you doing it already right like yeah. it's so much cheaper like i don't have to drive <laughs> anywhere you can like trick me into working 16 hour days like no sweat yeah um, <laughs> you know like it's not <laughs> it is, there is there is tons of upside you don't have to pay for real estate like yeah. i mean now sucks for the real estate market <laughs> but <laughs> Uh, sucks for the notion of a city, uh, mm -hmm. but it is. It does. I do think that you're right. That it is a. This is a fundamental shift. Like, and and we're looking at a year of like sheltering, basically. You know, like in yeah, yeah. in that yeah. notion. Like these politicians of politics, right? But mm -hmm. there's no way this is going to be normal um, before the end of the year. No, no way. No way. I, I would yeah. absolutely agree. Um, <laughs> I mean, if we if we just bring it onto the threat report, um, mm -hmm. obviously I uh, digested it, writing a, a brief summary. I, I, I will admit <laughs> uh -huh. I am a I am a layman with a, a lot of the, uh, the terminology used. Um, well, we do write yes, it for kind of a broader audience. We're not writing specifically for security practitioners. We try to hit yeah. It like, so it's a broader audience. I I really. will take criticism. <laughs> we do want it oh no, sorry. To be I, at least accessible. No, no, no. So, 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 my piece was <laughs> was written for a broader audience. I understood the narrative. Sure. It's just obviously there's some pretty specific kind of terminology in there. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that's what we can talk through. I mean, I guess sure. I don't know how we want to do it if we work through each of the sections, maybe. But perhaps a sort of starter for ten. Mm -hmm. You could you could summarize the the kind of core findings. Um, so I can have them from you. And and I guess particularly interesting if if anything kind of jumped out at you as as something that maybe you weren't expecting or, or there was something new highlighted in the report that perhaps differentiates from previous ones or anything like that? Sure. So the data, so, so the period covered ends at December 31st, 2019. So yep. <laughs> super sure how great this is going to be going forward. Well, it's changed. Um, since then. <laughs> um, I do think there are still some fundamentals in there, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, that companies are, for example, like one of the biggest findings we found um, which is not surprising. Oh, boy, a lot of this report is just like, and that's what we thought was going to happen. Um, <laughs> but a lot, a lot of the things we found were things like um, companies are continuing to, um, you know, build and deploy just like straight up vulnerable systems and putting them on the internet. And right. so this is th these are things like Windows machines with um, SMB exposed. SMB okay. is uh, stands for server message block. Nobody calls it that, mm -hmm. um, but it's the Windows kind of everything protocol. It's file sharing, it's administration, mm -hmm. it's authorization, it's printing, it's mm -hmm. everything, um, and that is exposed on the internet, like to a pretty huge degree, which is shocking to me. Um, 
I mean, security people are pessimistic kind of by nature, but it, it, is, it is surprising to me that the volume is still as high as we see. So like, and, and we know that attackers are into this because we see the attack traffic, um, okay. you know, hitting our honeypot. So we see like attacks using the eternal blue exploit uh, yep. payload that was released three years ago and was probably the most talked about security event ever uh right. yeah you know because it hit you know it, it was responsible for wanna cry it was responsible for not pitch it was like the most costly cyber attack in the history of everything mm. um according according to the white house <laughs> anyway um and which one of the thing one of the few things they say that's true um, <laughs> and, um it absolutely was like it it knocked major companies offline for sure. a, a while it like absolutely killed people when like um nih uh, hospitals were taken offline right so like mm. uh it was it was a big deal and in major media it was on nightly news it was on tv everybody like even non-security people knew about it uh mm. and it's still a problem like we still see this and it's like guys come on what can we do with this um like this has kind of spurred us for this year too especially this year is that we're going to be working more on seeing what we can do to like just knock SMB as a protocol off the internet. Like, and it's from Microsoft. Microsoft says, do not expose this to the internet. Like this is, Microsoft is on board with this. So I'm not like dissing on Microsoft. Um, <laughs> sure. They used to pretend that it was okay for the internet. It is not okay for the internet at all. Like even if you are like super patch or SMB three, you've got all your key side, you've got all the cool stuff, right? You're, you're as secure as you possibly can be. It's still not good for the internet. Um, yeah. because you're one you're one o day away. and like, and we know that SMB is like ridiculously complicated. Nobody really understands it. And that is like literally true. And we learned this when um the EU wanted to like have mm -hmm. wanted Microsoft to hand over the source code to SMB. and they're like, sorry, we don't have it. And, <laughs> and it's like, okay, I guess that's cool. Um, there are competing specs for it that are always a source of bugs. like the the interface between like Samba and Windows machines is always like real sketchy. And this like just tells you that there's something creepy going on in there yeah um, and, and so like that that was like the for me that was like probably the most visceral reaction i had to the data that we had for the threat report is like come on guys like we have graphs on of like the unique sources of, of eternal blue and we have like graphs on how much smb we found and what versions they are and like vulnerable versions like literally hundreds of thousands of vulnerable versions of this thing <laughs> that are almost certainly already owned by the way like okay. it, it's impossible that they can't be at this point yeah um and they're just chugging along, like doing crypto mining, and just kind of hanging. So, so what? What? Why? Maybe that's the million dollar question. But what? Why yeah. is is that still the case? What are enterprises it's by default. doing or um, not doing? Or, or it's legacy. So it's legacy applications that yeah. um, require Windows Seven for okay. starters, right? Like mm -hmm. Windows Seven went end of, end of life in January, mm -hmm. and for and now. That's a little bit loaded because Microsoft will occasionally still release patches for end of life stuff um, if you mm -hmm. really twist their arm on it or if there's like a major event. Um, but it it is predicated on a disaster first and foremost. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, without a disaster, all your low and slow like APT style actors can just pop these things all day long. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's just no and 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 without fear of. Um, you know, any patch stopping them, no one's going to be detecting them because the kinds of people that deploy, the kinds of enterprises that deploy SMB on the internet by accident are probably not the kind that also have like robust security, you know, solutions. Sure, sure. Yeah. So it's, it's bad news kind of all around. And plus you have like this knock on like tragedy, the commons effects of like, okay, well now I have hundreds of thousands of vulnerable machines, what happens when someone weaponizes them? Like, we don't know, because well, we do know, we have lots of examples, it's called Mirai, <laughs> and, uh, which took out like Twitter, you know, like right. by accident. Um, yeah. Um, so like that, for me, that was like the, the, the most, uh, not so much, I, I guess it was, no, it was surprising. It was surprising that the population of SMB machines didn't keep trending down. Like we we lost some during WannaCry and we did mm. we're seeing it. And then it just kind of it kind of flattened out. Like the curve flattened out at the end at still a very high number. So in the okay. in the millions. Uh, and so that's that's not no bueno. So uh, I mean how does that kind of impact obviously the, the threat report is as is as useful for you guys as as everyone mm -hmm. else that reads it. I mean how how does how do the findings kind of impact how you 
assess, reassess, evolve the proposition so that you're making sure that you're helping these enterprises? I mean, what specific kind of services or products are addressing these kind of issues? Uh well, for us, um, you know, we'll take this data and we'll so that we know, right? It's like, okay, yeah. SMB is a big, big bad deal. Um, mm -hmm. Any company that we are starting at as like, okay, you want to sign up for, for incident detection response? Cool. What's your SMB look like? Mm -hmm. Are you, is it accessible from the internet? Because like, you're going to have to fix that first. <laughs> like, right. you, yeah, yeah. you have to be this tall to ride the Rapid7 train. Do this right? before like, we do anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so... And so that's kind of that, you know, we'll have scoping calls like for pen testing like this too. Like we will get on pen testing engagements and say like, okay, well, you know, we did do a light scan already from like open source data of your stuff and you have this stuff open. You don't want to hire a pen tester to just find this again. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's an expensive way to do asset management is have pen testers find it for you. Mm -hmm. um, so like we, we will talk people out of like buying pen testing services based on this. Um, okay. And so, like, and then they'll go off and hopefully they'll fix their thing or they'll go to some, you know, crappy pen test shop and get their checkbox sure. for compliance. Um, but that's not the kind of business we're in. So, <laughs> um, so that, so that informs kind of like how we, you know, kind of how we approach our customer base. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that, so it's things like that. And it's not just SMB, obviously. Like I talk a lot about SMB because I think it's a kind of major problem. Um, but there are other yeah. things like Telnet and FTP, for example, like, old timey internet protocols that you know had their place but they were written and deployed in a time before encryption like before like people knew about encryption obviously but like devices didn't have the oomph to do like all the you know in crypto things that you needed it to do like encryption is often pointed at as like oh well that will slow your thing down because you got to do all this extra stuff um, sure sure you no know, we see today that like you know computers are faster and storage is deeper and bandwidth is wider. So like we can do encryption just kind of as a matter of course. Okay. Um, but that's another hobby horse I get on a lot of like, well, <laughs> don't expose Telnet to the internet. Like, yes, I understand. It's an internet technology. It's also was written in 1979. So like <laughs> we can do better now, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the sections I was interested to kind of find a little bit more out about uh -huh. uh, was the, the, the focus on the security programs. So presented as a, a new section, I believe, of the report. So pulling in that user yeah. experience, could you could you kind of expand on that? Um, sure. And I guess so tell I me about some of those about, findings, yeah. I think you're talking about like attack framework kind of stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. So yeah, like I, we are big fans of attack framework. Um, okay. um, don't tell me, don't ask me what it stands for. It stands for <laughs> If you can't tell me, I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah, let me think. No, I got it. <laughs> uh, adversary tactics, techniques, and common something that begins with a K. Um, <laughs> common something. I don't know what it is. Uh, e pass. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> close enough. I got eighty percent. Solid B. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, attack framework lets us um, really communicate. You know, things. You know, what attackers are doing in mm. your environment, in in a way that is like. For one, it's standardized. Um, it's mm -hmm. some. It's it's very rapidly becoming universal. Um, attack like attack framework came from uh, the MITRE uh, MITRE company, which is a sort of U.S. government, sort okay. of private think tank kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. They also invented incidentally CVE, so like all the CVE numbers okay. you see associated with vulnerabilities. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. People hate CVE. People love attack framework. <laughs> um, and it's like attack is like the memeiest security thing they've ever produced because people are bonkers about it. Every security person loves it. Um, I have yet to meet someone and say like attack framework kind of sucks. Like I've never met anyone who says that. But you'll hear this about CVE all the time, by the way. Like okay. um, CVE is garbage. Like it's awful and it's not even representative <laughs> of vulnerabilities. But that aside, by the way, I'm on the CVE board, so I can talk. To <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, people hate it. Um, when it, but like attack is great because like it tells it it really lets you like kind of lay out so like what's all the preconditions for an event like how like what do attackers do to move from like you know compromise to privilege escalation to lateral movement to payload execution to exfiltration of data like it really just like lays it out in a very intuitive way that just like really you know it clicks with people um and so we've we are we have moved basically all of our detection and response to kind of fit into the attack framework on so we can describe things like 
you know, how often do we catch attackers and at what stage of the attack? Like, it's one okay. thing to say, like, yeah. oh, yeah, we caught an incident. Um, it's another to say, like, we caught an incident and we're positive that this was, like, a precursor to a real attack. So, like, sure. we can kind of, we can say, um, it's like, and we, so, P.S., we we solved a whole bunch of problems that didn't happen by solving it early on in the chain. Yeah, yeah. And so it's always about, like, moving all your detections to the left, um, you know, before they have a chance to, like, do bad things. Like, and it's great, like, if you catch people on the exfil stage, like, if people are exfiltrating data from your company, you have big problems, but at least you caught them then. <laughs> um, and it gives you an idea of, like, where to go backwards. But, yeah, yeah. you want to you wanna hit it early on, obviously. Um, you know, and 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 uh, Rapid Seven uh, MDR at least, they're pretty good at this. Um, this was another. This was a. The finding from the report was we hit um, about ninety percent of incidents we are catching in that early early stage. Yeah, I saw um, that. Yeah. And I did not believe. I thought our like instrumentation was broken. It's like there's no way we're that good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and but we looked and we're like, nope, it actually is true. It's like holy macaroni. Like that is, you know, I I don't want to turn the threat report into like a big like patting yourself <laughs> on the back kind of thing. But you guys get a pat on the back. Like it, you're pretty good at this. Uh, um, how so how much higher surprised. than that? So how much higher is that than what, what were you expecting then? I mean, how, I I would for, for my context, pretty, yeah. I, I I would expect a a mature org security organization that has like good detection. I would expect in the neighborhood of like 50 50 like as a baseline. I would expect right, okay. like 50 percent of like that very early kind of like initial touch, yeah. and then 50 percent everywhere else. Right. Sure. Um, the fact that they hit 90 percent is just is shocking to me. Um, and I say that like as a former pen tester and as a developer on Metasploit, it's like, oh man, you guys would catch me like instantly. Like that sucks. As an attacker, this is awful news. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, lost the line there. I, I, <laughs> I wanted to ask about financial services, fintechs, uh, and the kind of evolution in that sector. It's it's a sector that I work across. Uh, particularly uh, for one of our publications. And obviously this article will appear in, in that kind of segment as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's always an interesting one for me. I mean, again, as, as brief or as lengthy as you want, but what's your sort of take on on how that as a sector, the, the specific threats facing kind of fintechs, financial services? I mean, obviously you've got this big migration to, to us all banking with our mobiles and spreading yeah. everything out. I mean, I assume there's quite a, a broad threat landscape in, in that sector. So, yeah. Financials are a favorite target, you know, because that's why do you rob banks? That's money, money yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so like there is, there's plenty of like fishing activity around there, around the endpoints. Mm. Um, you know, that said though, I do think so. In our reporting in finance, uh, yeah. hey, remember when I said like we catch them like 90% of the time? In in fintech, we we hit them <laughs> at that about half percent. So like okay. that initial access, we are we are down in the like 50% range, mm -hmm. um, which is not bad. Um, you know, because the the first two um, totals up to what is it about 87% of the time. So we'll hit yep. you on it. Like we'll catch bad guys on initial access and on the execution phase, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty good. Um, we don't tend to see them really anywhere else. Like there's a couple of like bumps um, along along the attack framework of like we'll see them when they're trying to be too clever. Okay. Um, so we'll catch like evasions rather than the attack itself occasionally. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is which is interesting. Like that's again like I mean if you're a criminal, stop reading now. Um, <laughs> don't read our threat report to find out like where you can do better. But like. <laughs> Honestly, like I, I so I've I've worked at a IPS company, so we made we were intrusion protection systems. This is like okay. an inline device that um, sat on your network and like picked out you know attacker behavior. This is yeah. before like there was a lot of encryption everywhere. Um, and uh, and one of the one of the tricks we did a lot. Um, I wrote signatures for this thing, mm. um, and one of the tricks we did a lot was like we want to pick out the evasion rather than the attack because mm -hmm. like we'll see like obfuscated JavaScript that doesn't look like normal javascript even like minified stuff sure. we'll see we'll see attacker specific you know tropes that we see just kind of come up over and over again and things mm -hmm. like in in um 
you know, in like cross-site scripting attacks and things like that, mm -hmm. right? Like we'd see this mm -hmm. come up that you never see anywhere other than malicious behavior. So that's the kind of thing that that is, right? Like we're catching, yep. we're, we're, we're catching the, you know, the, the, the way they are, they're being, like I said, they're being too clever and we catch the cleverness. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we see that in FinTech specifically um, okay. more than most. Um, okay. Which tells me too that there are probably really good, like there are decent endpoint detection going on. There's like, especially when you're talking about like credit issuers and yeah. like kind of larger banks where they have pretty excellent AI, right? They have good machine yeah. learning. They know how people buy things and they can kind of detect fraud as it happens, and then they'll they'll do that in their whole fraud sure, detection section, sure. which is not technically information security, but it's like a kissing cousin to that. Yeah, um, I would love to see more in the way of um, marrying those disciplines. Like I would love okay. to see more like banks talk at like Black Hat, you know, for example, mm -hmm. or like present papers mm -hmm. and those kind of forums are like, this is how we do this. Cause it's always kind of like, that's like, if you think security is impenetrable, holy macaroni. Like if you <laughs> look at like how finance does it, like, <laughs> like it is a voodoo, like according to everyone. Um, and so it's, <laughs> so, so that tells me anyway, that, that attackers are forced into this evolution, which then gets you get you another opportunity to detect them. Um, so that's that's basically the takeaway on fintech. Like the thing that worries me about the financial sector, like as a as a defensible kind of IT infrastructure is yeah. all of the custom code they have. Um, okay. So there's two things that go on there. One, they have a ton of custom applications that just don't see um, no, no one. It, it is nearly impossible to like get a trial copy, right? Of like the right, internal right. software used in a bank to test it for bugs. And like, sure. how do I, okay, well, let's say yeah. I do compromise something. How do I use this to like do privilege escalation? So like mm. you don't get the visibility that you get in something like Windows or something like very yep. common, right? Um, so that's that's a problem. And that's a problem that that industry has to solve. They need to hire, uh, you know, it's, the security people are scarce, but hey, everyone's losing their job now. So um, <laughs> maybe banks have an opportunity uh, to hire some code auditors. And uh, that would be great because, uh, you know, you got to get the hackers paid. Um, <laughs> always want to pay the hackers. That's first and foremost. Keep them um, on your side. <laughs> and so I think that's one area that, that bothers me. The other is um, people who work in this industry. Um, you know, as we say, like phishing is like the number one threat. Um, this is especially true in finance because people who work in finance are constantly opening Excel spreadsheets that are emailed to them constantly. <laughs> it is like all they do. It is like 80% of their job. And and every time their mail client yells at them, do you want to execute these macros? And you're like, yes, God damn it. This is my job. <laughs> and <laughs> it is my job to see how these macros go. Um, that presents a very unique challenge for phishing because I can't say things like don't open attachments because guess what? That's why I'm paid to do yeah, the thing yeah. I do. So that's really hard. That's really hard to do. Um, okay. The, the silver lining on that is like, if you're in this mode of like, yes, I open attachments all the time. I open Word docs and Excel sheets all the time. They're running macros all the time. If any of those are like executing PowerShell yeah. as like the thing that the macro does, you know that that's a bad guy. Like you, mm. there is, as far as we know, <clears throat> there's no one in finance that uses Excel that also uses PowerShell, um, which is a you know way to interact with the operating system. Yeah. Um, to do their job, there there is, as far as we know, there is no legitimate need for that. Um, right. And so we just have rules in our endpoints. It's like if you ever see PowerShell as a child process of Excel, just kill it. Just kill it immediately. And okay. It. So um, Did, that gives us a little bit of a trick. <laughs> do, do, do you think that I mean, particularly when I talk to others in in financial services sector, and again, this may apply to kind of all enterprise sectors and industries. Um, is there a distinct kind of difference between, I guess, what you would call incumbent or legacy institutions, as opposed to kind of more startup, new, newer players to the market in terms of how prepared they are for threat and how they're tackling their security? Um. So, like large finance. So, like established financial institutions you know got that way over sure. decades and yeah. that implies like a decades worth of, of legacy yeah um that is kind of floating around their network of like well you know i don't know really how this thing works the guy who wrote it doesn't work here anymore it's an access database sorry i yeah, mean yeah. <laughs> it worked at the time and there's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution so <laughs> that's you find that a lot in these networks and that's that's more in the realm of uh, penetration testing than just like mm. sniping from the internet okay um like that would be a like 
most of the threats we see um, don't care about you. Like they don't care about like your industry. They're, yeah. they're not targeting you in particular. When you're dealing with folks who are targeting finance specifically, mm -hmm. they are in a much better position, right? Like they have, I don't want to say they have the upper hand when it comes to like attack and defense, but mm -hmm. um, they're in a much better position because they will know things about your, you know, the kind of, the kind of stuff that you run in your IT network that is unique yeah. to finance that you don't find in like retail or you don't find in manufacturing or whatever. Sure. So they they will be tailoring their attacks. So it feels like these guys know everything about you when they really only know like one thing about you. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's the kind of thing to look for. Like if you're running IT security out of these kind of organizations, is like well, what makes me unique? So I can I can spend some time on that, um, knowing that most of the attacks are not unique to me. Most okay. of the attacks only care that I'm running Windows and I have Cisco routers, right? Because right, that's right, right. everyone. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and you know, as we change the way we work today, like, you know, a, a, for a long time, like I have been a champion for as a pen tester. I have been trying to get like the CFO's home router in scope forever for pen testing. <laughs> I think now is the time I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so yeah, like your crappy home router, like Linux or Belkin or whatever, or the one that like BT gives you, or yeah. the one you know, like your ISPs, like router that you've probably never even looked at. Um, I think suddenly that's a really good target, especially if you're going after fintech. Um, yeah, when you sure. know your executive suite is at home all of the time. I mean, yeah, that's a really good thought, isn't it? You, you think the potential changes that, that that could be necessary to facilitate, you know, a true kind of working from home lifestyle and, and business. Yep. And it's like, you, you can have all the VPN in the world. Um, if I can own your edge router at your house, mm -hmm. uh, you, I own you. Like, that, that, that is mm -hmm. kind of game over at that point. Um, and it's like... The timing is a little unfortunate because just this, la this last <laughs> summer at Black Hat, um, there's yep. a researcher, his name is Orange Sai. Um, mm. Look him up, he's freaking amazing. Uh, T-S-A-I is his last name. Cool. First name orange, like color. Um, he released a whole bunch of research on like the state of VPNs. Okay. Um, he, he dropped like 12 bugs or something on like a whole bunch of VPN gear. Right. Uh, and they're still having a bad time with that. So like that on top of now everyone's on vpn that is yeah, yeah. that is the recipe right there so like i don't know how it's going um in the world i don't even know how much like criminals even care about like bleeding edge security research mm -hmm. when phishing just works mm -hmm. um <laughs> but um it's something to look at so i mean i guess it, i was <laughs> going to try and kind of summarize some of those threats uh in the report and some of that data in the report and try and distill it down to, to some sort of key recommendations, whether there's any mm -hmm. things that, you know, enterprises absolutely should be doing from day one. Um, granted, the, the the data kind of finished at the end of last year, and we've, we've admitted that there's been a pretty significant change since then. Um, sure. But I mean, off, off the back of uh, the threat report, and you can bring in some of the more recent stuff if you want. I mean, what, what are really the core things that enterprises just have to be doing to get this better and to get it right? So I think that if you're, if you're truly an enterprise operation right like you yeah. have more than one security person mm. um you you need to be adopting attack framework like right away like you mm. like you need to be describing everything you do in terms of attack framework because it just makes everything so much easier it makes it easier mm -hmm. to like convince your boss to like buy you gear that you want sure. right sure. Uh, so like this is absolutely in your interest as an employee um to 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 get familiar with this and it's fun mm -hmm. and people talk about it and it's great it's a good community and everything too and it's open it's so it's it's open source so yeah. Um, great. So like, that's a great way to get yourself like out of kind of vendor lockdown mm -hmm. and being mm -hmm. able to like, you know, apples to apples compare across lots of vendors. Like I think rapid seven is great, but maybe you don't. So like, this is a way for you to determine like a tech framework gives you a, la a common language, you know? Yeah. Uh, so get on, get on the stick with that and it'll make your life way better. Um, okay. Things like, uh, you know, instrumenting, you know, having some kind of endpoint detection that does instrument things like Windows PowerShell shell and Windows administrative tools um, gets you a long way towards, um, you know, detecting that very early stage of like just after compromise, but right before anything bad happens, like that yeah. gives you a really good view into that. Um, mm -hmm. Like I say, there's no reason for a PowerShell process to be the child of an Excel process. It's never, mm -hmm. never legit. Um, so something like that uh, is is really critical. Uh, and then finally, like scanning 
your enterprise network, especially today, um, you know, your IP space from the outside, just like having some kind of viewing to that. You can do it yourself yep. um, with something like Nmap. You can do it yourself with something like uh, a, pro a product I like a lot is Rumble. Um, it's okay. a uh, it's it's like Mnap, Nmap, except Mnap is like really good at finding services. Rumble is good at finding things. Um, mm -hmm. So like Rumble's really good at like OS detection and patch levels, and and it's basically an asset management tool that uses like cool hacker tricks. Yeah, uh, really like it. We don't make it. It's not our product. It's, it's another product. But they do use uh, Recog, our our open source library for finger. Okay. So cool. This is one reason why I like it. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, scanning that from the outside, and if you don't want to do all the scanning or you're like too busy or whatever, like we are, don't worry, we're scanning you for you. Uh, <laughs> Project Sonar, um, you can come, you can come swing by uh, opendata.rapid7.com, um, or you can email us uh, research at rapid7.com, and we will absolutely tell you what you look like from the outside. Cool. So um, do those three things, you are eighty percent of the way there. <laughs> 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 Which is a good start. Um, we're getting near the hour. Um, are we, Madison, are we hard stop at the hour? And Todd as well. Um, I mean, I had a couple of product related questions. I think in hindsight, I can probably pick up that information from the site. Um, just going to kind of ask and run through some products. Person. So I, I am an, I've, as you may have noticed, I am a terrible salesperson. Uh, <laughs> so I'm probably not the best person to talk about our products. Uh, no, nah, that's cool. I mean, the, the website's great. pretty, pretty magic, so. hey, it's pretty <laughs> extensive on the site. And I think, you know, if I've got any questions like that, which are, I guess, a bit more kind of generic, we can always fire those over in an email and, and ask for some collateral on that. I mean, just, just kind of looking to wrap it up um, and, you know, appreciate we've probably touched on some of these points. Um, mm -hmm particularly around the COVID-19 stuff and, and where we're going from here. I was intending to ask you a kind of predictions of threat landscape and, and risk evolution um, over the next year, couple of what years and so on. Obviously, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's can you predict that yet? Or <laughs> it's, things are probably going to be different. Like, I mean, we are in a very new space in terms of the internet. I think the internet is going to be shaping it, shaping itself around like what humans do, um, obviously, because damn it, we're in control, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so up, unless and until the internet becomes self-aware, like we're still going to be influencing that quite a bit. Um, but that said, like the criminal activity is 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 in phishing. Like that is so yeah, yeah. like yeah. being having like a solid um, kind of user education. Uh, system from your IT yep. security people, like how to identify phishing and what to do when you identify it. Like, it's impo it's it's pointless to say like click carefully on things because like I don't know how to do that. Um, but yeah. there are ways to get people like you know more sophisticated about like what looks weird um, and what warrants a phone call. And by the way, people like phone calls because they don't have offices anymore and they love to talk to people. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a feature of humans. Like we kind of think it a lot. <laughs> And so, like, getting even get like you could even have a whole like phishing training exercise of like I'm gonna send you all a bunch of phishing email. Don't I'm not gonna tell you about it. Uh, you're gonna notice. You're gonna call somebody. You're gonna call your buddy. Yeah. And your buddy is hopefully in the IT security department, but maybe not. Maybe your buddy is like you know your program manager who got extra special training or something like that. So like you can <laughs> totally federate this stuff, um, and just have that like security culture in mind so we don't fall for scams um, because that's where the that's where the attackers live. Um, you know, other than that, uh, oh yeah, I almost forgot to say, yeah, you got to check your VPNs to see if you have split tunneling or not. Um, okay. you cannot, like, you're allowed to do split tunneling, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but you want to know that you're doing it on purpose and you have to, <laughs> it, like, that has to be an informed decision of yeah. like, okay, I am choosing not to see these indicators of compromise on, on the wire. Mm -hmm. Um, because, and because you might not have the bandwidth, like, uh, I, like I said, like I, I work with MITRE a lot um, mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. part of my work on the CVE board, and they switched to an on-prem hosted version of Skype because they're government and they need that for like a bunch of top secret stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. It was garbage for like the two first two weeks. It was awful. It was like, <laughs> oh cool, we have nine thousand employees and they're all on Skype now. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> it was the worst ever. And so like I've been trying like just dragging them into like the brave new world of Zoom for like their not top secret stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know that that that's going okay. <laughs> I I think our next board meeting might be on Zoom, so hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 
Look, we, we can wrap it up soon. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I, I think one thing I, I, that always comes across when you speak to others talking about this kind of stuff is, is that, you know, this, this evolution of the attacker and you've got to stay one step ahead and so on. But I, I guess with phishing, you're talking about still being the primary form of attack. If that's so I, successful, do, do the attackers need to evolve? Are they still evolving? Are, are they still changing the way that they're attacking? So, like, very sophisticated yeah, yeah. attackers who are targeting individual like certain enterprises hmm. are better at this right like and yeah. we do know that we see a lot we do see a ton of traffic around things like exploiting uh vulnerable applications on vulnerable operating systems that are exposed directly to the internet that have patches available but haven't been patched that is a very long sentence to say like they're hitting the easy stuff okay. <laughs> <laughs> And so, like that, that attack is is harder than a phishing attack. It's more technically challenging. Yep. Um, you do t like as a pen tester, like I know that like if I do that, I I've probably saved myself a lot of time. Sure. Um, I'm not waiting on someone to click a thing that I email them. Like mm -hmm. I, I, it's a lot more efficient, right? As yeah, as yep. a bad guy to do it that way. And so that that is a real threat, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's that's not the threat that most people are are in a position to even like defend against, right? Like that mm -hmm. that's IT security's problem. That's not your problem. Your yeah. problem is your email box, mm -hmm. and, and so that's why I like kind of bang on this phishing thing a lot because that's the thing that people can do. It's yeah. the one. It's kind of the one area you do have power over that, and like I don't know, password management. I could talk about password management for an, another hour. You don't <laughs> want to. That it's boring. <laughs> but, yeah, RIT yeah, guy tells me about, uh, RIT <laughs> guy tells me about password management all the time. It's uh, <laughs> I'm dreadful at it. It's very good for you. It makes you uh, impossible to fish for starters. It's a really nice defense. <laughs> um, look, Todd, that's really cool. I, I think we've kind of covered the main points I had. Um, I mean, as you say, you know, this is a subject that, that we could talk at in, in such detail. Um, is there anything specifically, I know we're kind of pitching this in line with some of the, the info in the report. Is there anything specifically that we haven't really touched on that's important or that you wanted to add in the context of that? From my perspective, if there's any more questions, I can always fire those over, but I don't want to leave if, if there's anything that we haven't really touched on. Uh, I think we hit most things. We did have a mystery in the report that I still don't have a good answer to, but it's like, we have a okay. graph in there about um, the kinds of malware we see in enterprises. Okay. Um, and you might remember it has, it's like a big V shape um, with right. like a lot of blue, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Because most of the time we see, you know, like rootkits and Trojans and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just kind of, I want to, I've owned you and now I want to persist my access. That's sure. the kind of thing that does. But then in June, we saw this like huge jump in cryptocurrency mining. That we didn't see anywhere else, and we can't explain it. Um, it's a mystery. Ah, I don't know. Okay. I don't know how much we can uh, write about that, but like, I still don't have a really good answer for it. Um, I've, I've got any ideas? So, or... so, like, we looked at like the price of Monero and the price of Bitcoin and like yeah. the kind of activity around <laughs> that. Um, we didn't really, we, and we didn't see anything there. Um, mm -hmm. We we do know now that. Um, what is it? Uh, the Emotet uh, malware family um, was at the top at last June was uh, was going through like a development phase. Um, and so like and it seems like they broke their Trojan. Okay. Right. <laughs> and so like right. we didn't see it anymore. Um, <laughs> and so I, that that is now a contender of why that was is that okay. like the malware gangs just like kind of busted their shit. It just broke. <laughs> <laughs> So, but that's like a real, we don't see a ton of like causal information. Um, sure, sure. But we do see now like Emotet is like, they're, they're coming back gangbusters. Um, they're, they're doing, they're doing a lot of, a lot of business these days um, and being more interesting about their attacks. Uh, so, so yeah, oh, I think Madison is, is texting me saying, I'm soon. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she's, she's jumped. Um, Look, oh, I don't good. Now take... she's gone. We can really talk shit about that. <laughs> she's bailed. <laughs> you went. You went too deep into the subject. Um, but yeah, hey, look, I, I, I think we've covered. The question is like that's the only other thing, and I don't even know if that's even worth writing. But anyway, I mean, I'm happy we've covered the main areas. You know, yeah. inevitably something always comes up when you're going through the info. If it does, uh, I guess you're happy for me to fire a question over to Madison or something like that. Um, 
But look, I'll, I'll uh, let you crack on, let you get on your way. And uh, it was really good okay. to speak to you. I really appreciate it. Really interesting stuff. Um, yeah. I look forward to speaking to you really soon, okay? All right. Have a great afternoon. Stay safe. Take care. All right. Watch your hands. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers.